All right, so welcome to biology. This is the introductory lecture of Bio 101, so the very first lecture of an entire year sequence. A lot of you will be going forward from here and taking that Bio 102 section. Um, everything you learn in Bio 101, I will expect you to understand in Bio 102 because that's the way those sequences work. I don't want to go back and reteach things. So this is the introductory lecture. We're using the Biology and Focus textbook, second edition. This is from chapter one. So the first chapter. And I'm going to begin with that open question, what is science? So out to you guys, what is science? Yeah, what is science? Okay. So it's big. Let me, let me see if I got you, right? So science is a process. That's one part of it. Science is a process where you're going to use data. You're going to use your observations, this is what you're taking in about the world, in order to make conclusions using the scientific method, which is, is this big problem-solving methodology. Is that general what it is? That's really, really good. Anybody else have another definition? What a functional definition of science? Otherwise, we can just go with that. Yes. Oh. The study of how, that's the really simplified form, the study of how things work, how you, uh, uh, how you can understand the world. You look at something, you try and figure it out. And we all do that. We try to figure out the way the world works. Ultimately, science is verifiable and science is testable. If you remember nothing else, remember, science is testable. So we're going to use observation, investigation, um, in order to explain theoret uh, phenomena. It's all about, like you said, building a more complete understanding of the world, figuring out how the world works. Oh, remember earlier I told you guys glow-in-the-dark strawberries? There they are. Th yeah, okay, those are strawberry plants. They're glowing, sorry. The fruit also glows, but those were the initial um, results. Yes. Do you write everything? So, okay, test uh, uh, note-taking stuff. Do you have to write everything? No, you don't have to write everything. Um, you have access to all of these notes. You'll have access to video on this. I would write the important things. If you want and you feel like you want to print off the PowerPoints and just write sort of notes off in the margins, feel free to do that. Um, but when I say something's really important, like science is testable, that's probably something to write down. You guys will probably hear later on, I'll say, uh, this will be on the exam. When I say this will be on the exam, I'm really not kidding. That'll be on the exam. Like, if I was to say, what's the difference between science and do, 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 pseudoscience? Exam question right there. What's the difference between science and pseudoscience? The answer is, science is testable. Pseudoscience is not. Pseudoscience is this cool, well, it's not cool, it's actually horrible. Pseudoscience is where you're going to use vague, exaggerated, or untested claims. You see pseudoscience all the time now. If you are on any social media whatsoever, like 90% of the posts there are absolute pseudoscience. Uh, there's an over-reliance on confirmation rather than refutation. This one time, I put jello on my head and it cured my headache. Pseudoscience. I'm not going to go around putting jello on my head anymore. I'm totally going to put jello on my head some more because it feels really good. But aside from that, <laughs> It's not going to cure my headache. There's a lack of openness to testing by other experts. Um, I'm sure you guys have done this. And you, maybe you haven't. Do you guys know the History Channel? You, uh, you know conceptually of the History Channel. Now, the History Channel, surprisingly enough, used to be about history. Yeah, remember? It's like the World War II channel, pretty much. All the time. But now, ancient aliens. Ancient aliens all the time. Um, there was um, a, there were two, two issues that spring to mind. One is ancient aliens, you know the guy who's like, aliens. Um, they were talking about pyramid power. You see, in this lab, they built a copper pyramid. And the pyramid in the lab lifted into the air and started hovering and spinning. 
And they were talking about this as this new energy source. So other scientists said, that's really cool. We want to do that. I want to do that in my lab. And the, uh, the people in the first lab said, oh, you can't. You can't. It won't work in your lab. <laughs> it only works in my lab because my lab lies on a ley line. Like, OK, lack of openness to testing. Another one is um, a psychic by the name of Yuri Geller. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of this guy. So Yuri Geller is a 1980s, a lot of the child of the 80s. Um, he was a, um, a psychic who could bend spoons. So <laughs> you're right. And if you ever look at uh, these spoons that bend back and forth, he would uh, do it with his mind. And he said, um, how do you put this? He said, I can bend these spoons. And scientists said, we want you to come into the lab and do this under controlled conditions. We want to see this. And he's like, I can't do it there. I can only do it where I'm comfortable. Lack of openness to testing. An absence of progress. Have you guys ever heard of a, of a field called astrology? What is astrology? Exactly. Most people say it's the study of like the, the, the moon and the stars. It's not. It's the zodiac. It's studying how do the stars affect us. What's the other one where you're studying the planets and the stars and everything? Astronomy. There's a big difference. <laughs> no, I totally understand. You're looking, at, you're looking at that historically, but what you're experimenting with, what you're determining is how does that affect people? And this was something that was studied in depth during the time of Ptolemy 2,500 years ago. Since then, we've not progressed forward with it. It's all the same. And you guys open up, the, you guys still do that, don't you? Like, open up the new, like you have a newspaper. Um, <laughs> oh, well, I'm not even concerned about it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Doesn't bother me. Um, there's an additional sign in the zodiac. Yay, don't care. Um, but the big thing is there's lack of progress on how does this affect people. 2,500 years, nothing's happened. Pseudoscience. Personalization of the issues today. Everything is personalized. Everything is attacking somebody instead of their research. When you're attacking somebody and not attacking the quality of their research, you've got pseudoscience and the use of misleading language. Cancer can be cured. Just buy my book and I'll tell you. Uh, <laughs> scientific test proved Lucky Strike is milder than any other principal brand. <laughs> well, they're, they're super mild. Scientific test said so. Scientists must, you know, therefore it's uh, science. No, it's pseudoscience. And my favorite, honest to goodness, real life uh, lecture at a college. James Caper's Methods and Practices of Psychic Defense from Hostile Invaders from Another Planet. Now. Pseudoscience. Why is that pseudoscience? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's a lot going on, but this is pseudoscience. It could be science. How could it be science? How about that? If we could do it multiple, if we could test it and test it and test it and test it. Oh, this is even better. We need a hostile invader from another planet. Yeah, we need an alien. So you got to sit across the table from the alien and be like this. Attack me. Um, hostile invader. Pseudoscience versus science. What is the difference then between science and pseudoscience? Science is testable. And there's the one thing you should have written down. Well done. Did, no, that's a, you were just asking. That what's, of all of this, what do you need to write down? Science is testable. Mark Twain. If you have not yet read Mark Twain in your life, you need to. How many, any guys going into English composition? Okay, you've read Mark Twain, right? Oh, a long time ago. He's brilliant. Yeah, well, of course they've been blacklisted because he's brilliant. What did he say? He said, it's easier to fool people than convince them that they have been fooled. That is very true. Um, the first time somebody learns something, and I was l I, I l I'm taking all these education classes, 
the first time somebody learns something, that is what's termed their, like, their, pers their meaning perspective. That is where they build their initial thoughts on something. And from then, it's all about challenging that. And people don't like to be challenged. Um, you hear full people. And you guys probably all have that one uncle or cousin that you don't get along with. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. You, I got it. I've got this guy. <laughs> I'm going to say it because my cousins will watch this and be like, I hate your dad. Um, <laughs> my uncle Larry is the most bigoted, horrible person you will ever meet. Um, I do not go to family functions anymore because I don't like him. But back when I was younger and naive, I thought, you know, maybe he just needs somebody to talk to him about this. That was a mistake. <laughs> um, so after several um, Halloweens, like we get together at Halloween, Thanksgivings um, of, of arguments, I realized he is this way, he has been this way his whole life, and he is not going to change. It was easy to convince, uh, to convince him of something. He is dead convinced of every single um, conspiracy theory out there, yeah. And it, there's nothing I can do to, to change his mind. He is convinced, and I can't convince him that he's been fooled. I'm part, actually, he's pretty convinced now that I'm part of the, uh, the conspiracy. I'm the part of the, yeah, the Illuminati. I'm the scientific elite. An idea will become pseudoscientific when the science cannot be separated from the ideology. We all have preconceived notions. We all have strongly held beliefs. It's going to be up to us to sort of put those beliefs aside and look at the data. We live in an area here, I've noticed, where everything is like an organic fruit or an, you know you can buy organic or you can buy uh, like modified foods or engineered foods and there is a strong feeling that organic foods are better I could put a thousand one pieces of documentation in front of them that says there's no difference but they have been fooled and it's hard to convince them that they've been fooled um, and of course people will say go the other way with me they'll say look here's Here's all this information about how organic food is better. You're a geneticist. Look at this data. And, um, and, and of course, you'll come to the same conclusion I have. Huh, yes. It, it, everything is carbon-based, right? <laughs> um, organic foods. Uh, you guys have strong beliefs on this, one way or the other, right? I, you don't have to tell me which way because you know which way I go, and you don't want to like, admit that. But you, you've got a belief. Uh, climate change, you've got a belief. It's either happening or it's not happening. But no matter what anybody tells you, you're going to have a hard time changing your mind about it. Does that make sense? There are few people that um, can look at new data and bring it in and incorporate it into who they are and change their mind. I need you to be those people. I need you to be the ones who will take new data, bring it in, synthesize it, and create something new. An idea is pseudoscientific when we've stopped listening and stopped bringing in new content. It's, um, we're just, uh, we're, we, we have faith in something more than we can rationally believe in it. All right, so lights. Check this out. The most important question I'm going to need you guys to ask for the rest of your life is the same question the five-year-old kid asks. Why? Why, why, why? Everything why. Look at this. Check out this fish. It's got a completely transparent head. Th yeah, that's right. Those are dyes. And they're gigantic. Why? That's, okay, well, that's, that's an answer. That's not a question. It is on planet Earth. Star-nosed mole. Right, but why? Wh why? It not, not, well, okay, maybe. We can test it. To get worms, it's like, hey, look, you got friends. <laughs> Perception, feeling things around it. Oh, I got a fun story about a star nose mole. Um, so I have a mole in my yard. Perhaps you guys have moles in your yard all over the place. Um, it was pouring rain just a few weeks ago, as if it doesn't ever not pour rain. 
Um, and this mole jumps out of the ground, scurries across my driveway, and jumps into the other side. And my wife turns to me and said, quick, go out there and save him. <laughs> I was like, I've been trying to kill him for three weeks. <laughs> this is not the time to save him. <laughs> the water drowning. This thing, you guys see it, right? Little sort of gecko right there. Why? That's an easy one, right? Camouflage. It's hidden. It can sneak up on things, or other things can't sneak up on it. Always why. The world is constantly changing. The problem is, it's not, the, the natural world, is, uh, it tends not to change much over our lifetime. So it seems like the world is set. It seems like the world is static. The animals that are here now are the animals that have always been here because our lives are so short. But over lots and lots of time, over many millennia, heritable traits can accumulate. Oh, I've tied myself up. This is wild mustard. Wild mustard, it looks almost like um, a little ragweed, pollen. You know, the, I just call it pollen plants, the little yellow ones. Humans began culturing that, began cultivating it. And we created lots of different strains of food from it. So wild mustard, brassica, not rapa, but alaracea. Uh, We've got Brussels sprouts that come from it, cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, and kale all come from the same root plant. <laughs> They're all, they have all been selectively chosen by humans. Uh, these are very different looking plants with very different amounts of different tastes, different everything. But they all came from the same base. This has happened over the course of human civilization. Just a few thousand years, we've gone from wild mustard to cabbage. Over time, plants change. It may not be terribly detectable in our lifetime, but over the long haul, big changes accumulate. So here in biology, we're going to pose questions about the living world and seek answers through scientific inquiry. It's all about the study of life. So far, so good. In this course, we have four themes, four core themes that are united by the central theme of evolution. Organization, uh, the expression and transmission of genetic information, the transfer and transformation of energy, and uh, how organisms interact with other organisms in the environment. So these are the four big things we're looking at. These are the themes that you'll see repeated over and over and over again. First off, we have organization. When you're studying life on Earth, you're going to note that there is a scale, uh, th there's a scaling issue. You can look at the very, very, very bottom, down at the size of the atom, and then atoms will come together and form molecules. Molecules will form organelles. Organelles will form cells. Cells will form tissues. Tissues form organs. Organs form organ systems. Organ systems, organisms. Organisms form populations, and so on. It's organized. It's broken down bit by bit by bit. You can move up. You can move down. But there's an organization to everything. Interestingly enough, life is self-organizing. Again, I do a whole lecture in Bio 102 about um, self-organization leading to initial uh, properties of life. Reductionism is where you're zooming into a finer and finer scale. So what it says is um, you take a complex system, a human, you guys, and you break them down bit by bit by bit by bit by bit until they're really, really com uh, small. You zoom in on it. You guys have played with your phone's uh, camera, I assume, where you do the whole like zoom in. So you go from seeing the whole picture to a really narrow focus of it. And then the, you can go farther and farther and farther in, and you see more detail of just that one area. But the problem is you tend to lose some of the, um, the bigger picture. As a biologist, you need to keep in mind the bigger picture as you're looking closer and closer in. Mm. 
when we begin to look at um, the different levels of organization, we see these things called emergent properties. So if you begin at the molecular level, the atom, you move to the molecule, the molecules, the organelle, and so on, and you're zooming out, you're starting to see the bigger picture. You begin to see properties that begin to get established only when those smaller pieces interact with each other. They're called emergent properties. The more of these things that you have interacting, the more complex processes you get. This is the inside of a watch. Now you can look very closely at a watch. You know, you look at it at the atomic level. You see iron, you'll see um, aluminum, brass, so on. That doesn't tell you much. You move farther out. You start to see the molecules that they formed, how they're interacting chemically. But you move even farther out, you start seeing gears. Now an individual gear doesn't do anything. You can't determine the function of a watch just from a single gear. But when you start seeing them put together, you go even farther out. That's where the emergent property comes. Now we get to the ability to tell time. So reductionism is when you're really focusing in and you start to see emergent properties only when you've zoomed back out. And those emergency, pro emergent, emergency, emergent properties are what we're really, really interested in biology. One of my most common uh, sayings in this class, and I will say it over and over and over again, and again, for those writing things down, which is hopefully it's all of you, um, I think just on just about every exam, I will have some question on there that talks about um, the form determines what. And it's always going to be form determines function. It is a key underlying principle of biology. Form determines function. At each level, we find a correlation between structure and function. See, it's right there too. That, so the question then is, does function ever determine form? Um, I'm going to go with no, because you always get the form first based on, and it comes down to those m mechanisms of evolution. It's like which came first, the chicken or the egg? It's, on, it, it's actually the egg. It's the egg because the, um, there's a mutation in the egg or there's variation in the egg. Yeah, now we know. Um, so whenever anybody asks you the question, I took Bio 101, I learned the answer. Chicken or the egg? It's the egg. Um, here we've got a stingray. You guys seen stingrays underwater? It looks like they're flying underwater. And that's because water is really just super thick air. Don't try and breathe it. Um, fun story. Um, when I was younger, I learned that oxygen is dissolved in water. Now, I was young and stupid, and I thought to myself, well, if oxygen is dissolved in water, and I know how diffusion works, and we'll get to that later, uh, if I take a deep breath while I'm underwater, I should be able to get oxygen out of it. I was eight at the time, and I was, I was in a bathtub. <laughs> And I started coughing. My parents were like, what's wrong? And I was like, I tried to breathe the water. <laughs> like, we're just going to concentrate on your sister. Um, penguin. It's got these little flappy things. Wings is what they're called, but flappy things work. Because Stingray also has flappy things. Little different, but ba same basic structure. Wide, jutting out from the sides. And what's it used for? And that's swimming or flying, flying through water because water is just super thick air. Flying fish, what do they use their flippers for? <laughs> well, you're like, oh, I want to say swimming, but they're flying fish. They use them for both. That form, these long extended appendages with um, very thin and very wide, uh, thin but wide allows for movement through both air and through water. I mean, penguins don't fly, but when you look at them underwater, it looks like they're flying. No, but I don't want to either, because I want to get through the class. <laughs> Sorry, we'll talk later. As we move up in complexity, as we move up in um, organization, we hit the cell. Now, you guys have all heard of the cell, right? You've studied it. 
You've probably drawn pictures of it or had to label pictures. Ooh, labeling pictures. I hate labeling pictures. That's like my least favorite thing in the world um, because cells don't look like that. I'm going to go on in, in, in about three weeks. I'm going to go off because one of my biggest pet peeves is this picture. And you know why? It all stems back to the mitochondria. <laughs> this is the mitochondria. Okay, I'm going to go off right now. Um, <laughs> this is the mitochondria in this picture. Now, you guys have seen this picture before, and you know it's mitochondria because they've got little squigglies and stuff. And it looks like there's, what, two, three of them in a cell? There are hundreds to thousands of mitochondria in every given cell. There are only two. <laughs> and they're really, really small. They're not big, giant balloon things. I hate that picture. It doesn't really give you an idea of what a cell looks like. And then when you go to graduate school and you're like, you see a real cell, and you're like, oh, well, that doesn't look anything. I've been lied to my whole life. Anyway, so the cell is the smallest unit of organization. And this is also what we're going to say for this class and only this class. The cell is the smallest unit of life. We will argue about that again in a future course, in an upper level course. But for this class at this time, the cell is the smallest unit of life. Whew, that's hard to say. And it's OK. All right, so that's, step, that's the first core theme, organization. Second theme, life's processes involve the expression and transmission out of genetic information. How many of you guys have heard of DNA? Yay. DNA is a great word. Um, it's deoxyribonucleic acid. So it's um, deoxyribonucleic acid because it's made of deoxyribose, and it's nucleic acid. It's the ultimate in winning Scrabble, too, because um, <laughs> true story. Um, I was playing my, uh, my good friend, my good friend Tom, because that's apparently how awesome I am is where I'm sitting down playing a game of Scrabble. Um, and I hit triple word score with uh, ribose. And they're like, fine. And then I wrote, next round, deoxy. <laughs> Deoxyribose. And then, and then um, uh, deoxyribose nucleic acid. Uh, no, no deoxyribose and then anyways it went like three words beyond that and he's like i'm done this game is over you're not allowed to use biology in scrabble so dna is sort of that hereditary information dna is going to get transcribed into a, a molecule called rna ribonucleic acid and then that ribonucleic acid creates the um the blueprint for creating proteins and proteins do just about everything in your body. There is no process that I can think of that is not in some way mediated by a protein in your body. So that process of moving from DNA to RNA and RNA to a protein is called the central dogma of molecular biology. This is sort of what connects all of um, all biology together. So we're going to learn a lot about that transmission of genetic information. Now, in order for life to live, life needs energy. So third big uh, theme, transfer and transformation of energy and matter. We need energy. So where do we get the energy? When you need energy, where do you get it? Gabby, where do you get your energy? Not trying to trick you. What? Yeah, 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 you personally. When you need energy, what do you do? That's exactly what you do. You drink coffee. You eat, you drink, you take food into your mouth, and then it, it goes in, there's a whole thing it goes through. It goes into your mouth, and then it goes down into your stomach, and then from your stomach to your small intestines, and then your small intestines. All those nutrients get pulled out, and you can use those nutrients to build proteins, but also you can break them. And anytime you break chemical bonds, you release energy. Um, so we can break bonds to get energy for us. Now, you eat, do you drink coffee? That's awesome. Um, coffee, is, where does coffee come from? How about that? OK, I was just going to go with plants, but you know what? You guys went <laughs> farther than me. Well done. Um, cacao. You guys are really into coffee. Um, so they come from plants. Where do plants get their, their energy? The sun. They're photoautotrophs. Sun strikes the plant. The plant begins to create sugar. The sugar is then brought over to the mitochondria, which is the site of aerobic cellular respiration. 
um, where you're going to uh, break those bonds and you're going to end up creating a lot of energy intermediary molecules. You can use those to do work. So it's all about going from the kinetic energy of sunlight to the potential energy in the bonds of sugar to breaking that to creating kinetic energy to let Gabby do work. And that's what coffee is good for. When an organism like us um, uses that chemical energy to do work, muscle contractions, moving around, a lot of times what you're going to do is create heat. It's excess energy. It's, it's that energy that's wasted to the system. We're not going to use it for anything. Your body generates a lot of heat. You know that, though. I mean, you get in the winter, you get under a comforter, right? You, because that's the best place to be. Get under a comforter, and that comforter is going to trap that heat that your body's generating to keep you even warmer. And you just stay there and decide not to come to class at 9.30 in the morning. So it enters in at light as light and usually exits as heat. And in between, you're doing some work. Um, fourth theme, is that where we're on now? Yeah, fourth big theme. Organisms interact with other organisms in the environment. Every organism interacts with the other organisms. And I'm going to tell you a cautionary tale. It's a tale about kelp, kelp and sea anemones. Once upon a time, in the wide oceans of the world, there were whales. And they were everywhere. Um, I recently went and saw whales for the first time. Uh, real whales, not like dinky whales, and like big whales. And I was like, whoa, they're way smaller than I thought. Um, they were right. They, um, they, they eat a lot of small fish. Whales are carnivores, in case you didn't know. Um, I had to call Richmond and correct the SOLs, apparently. I was the, 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 the SOLs decided that um, whales were uh, herbivores. Yeah, I know. My daughter came home with that, and they're like, oh, no, they're all carnivores. And I was like, uh, oh, she said, they're all herbivores. And I was like, you, I'm going to deal with this. <laughs> These people don't know what a mitochondria is, and they don't know what a whale eats. <laughs> anyway, so we got these big whales. Well, the deal is whales also had oil in them. And if you know humans, we got a thing for oil. <laughs> we really love oil. So uh, humans in the 1800s uh, went whale hunting, and we hunted them almost to extinction. Uh, what was it? 1980s, because love the 80s, right? There was a movie that came out called Star Trek IV. And in Star Trek IV, they had to save the whales. It was all about we have to save the whales. Sure. Okay. Um, not just they, because they're, they're, they dive down, they, f they cause um, water to be pulled down with them. Yeah, no, I get that. But even more important, whales are food. They eat, not for us, whales are food for killer whales. Now, the orca is called a killer whale for a reason. What's the reason it's called a killer whale? They kill whales. <laughs> They hunt them. Killer whales, by the way, are not whales. They're dolphins. Um, now you know. Uh, they are the largest of the dolphin family. So they're evil dolphins that devour whales. That's what we got here. <laughs> Problem is, their food sources going, went away. They couldn't hunt whales. Now, whales are big and full of blubber, so one whale would sustain a pack of orcas. With the whales gone, the, whale, the killer whales, the orcas, have to switch to another food source. So in this case, they switch to seals. Now, seals are pretty big. We can eat, they can eat seals. And uh, it takes a lot more seals to eat than, um, than, than, than when whale. But they do. And then they get these cool images of, you guys have seen orcas hunting, where they'll beach themselves, grab the seal, throw it in the water, and chase after it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So uh, these whales, then eating seals, the seal population declined dramatically. They can't eat, so for every whale that they normally eat, they have to eat 50 seals. Well, they ate 50 seals, now there are no more seals, so they have to turn to another food source, the sea otter. Now they're small, but they're pretty easy to catch. They're sort of hanging out on the surface, go by, hump, 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 hump. Sea otter's gone. Sea otters, though, eat sea anemones. 
So if the sea otters are all dead, what happens to the sea anemone population? It goes up. Sea anemones eat kelp. Not just kelp, they eat the bottom of the kelp. So when they bite the, eat the kelp bottom, the rest of the kelp floats to the surface. <laughs> That's a lot like no, because whales aren't herbivores. <laughs> um, so the kelp forests are disappearing. Well, kelp forests are very important as a uh, source for f uh, food. They, the baby uh, fish live there. So if we have no more kelp forests, suddenly the fish population declines. So it's this idea of um, keystone species. You have all of these species interacting and having an enormous impact on the environment. It's our whole life. We are continually interacting with our environment. We do it all the time. Of course, you're going to see a lot of things about putting pollution into the atmosphere. That's sort of what humans do. We, are, we, we just produce carbon dioxide like crazy. That's like our thing on the planet. Just if we find it, we're going to burn it in some way. It's just what we do. Um, and it impacts the environment. Now, what ties all of these themes together is evolution. Organisms living on the Earth today are modified descendants of, these co of common ancestors. Here is, back to the whale, uh, the evolution of, or a possible evolution of the whale. Now, we, when we're talking about evolution, we cannot talk in certainties. This is a highly supported evolution of the whale where you move from this organism that sort of hunted on land, this wolf-like ancestor of the whale, the uh, Pachycetus, to an ambush predator, Ambulocetus. So Pachycetus, you can imagine sort of strolling along the banks of a, um, a swampland, the uh, Tethys Ocean, and trying to catch things. Small deer. deer were, uh, when this guy was around, deer were only about that big. Uh, deer were tiny. Over time, Pachycetus developed into an ambush predator, Ambulocetus. So Ambulocetus, think of a almost a mammalian crocodile. It would lay in the water. It would lay sort of. It would, okay, it would do like this, like this, and its its um, rostrum or uh, jaw would be on the ground like this. Now it couldn't hear very well, but you guys have been in bed before, right? Obviously, when you're in bed. You hear and you feel like every step in the house. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, yeah, that's how it would hunt. It, would, it wouldn't hear well, but it would feel those vibrations. And uh, as a small deer came by, it would lunge out, grab it, and pull it into the water where it would drown the deer and then eat it. Over time, it became more and more aquatic. Now. Ambulocetus was just a mammal, and it was prey. There were some huge fish at the time. But it got bigger and bigger and stronger teeth and more adapted to an aquatic environment. Its nostril would slowly moving back farther and farther. And for, so for millions of years, it had changed one generation to the next um, with these modifiable, heritable traits. The ones that could hunt better in the water were the ones that got more food and could reproduce more often, passing those traits on to their offspring. So most organisms are tied together. There's a unity to life. They share certain traits because they have a descendant from a common ancestor. If you look, we've got humans, cats, whales, and bats. We all have pretty much the same basic structures in our arms. And you all know that when you look at a cat, their front legs are their arms, right? I mean, all of us are like, they're all legs, but that's their, that's their hands. Right? Anyway, <coughs> you've got the same phalanges. Um, you've got the same metacarpals in all of these organisms because we all descended from a common ancestor. Concerns, questions? And now, finally, we talk about this guy, Charles Darwin, because I have to. Charles Darwin was around about 200 some years ago. <laughs> yeah, um, almost 200 years ago. And he published one of the most important influential books ever written on the origin of the species by the means of natural selection. So his idea, Darwin's big, big claim to fame wasn't chasing things to eat them. Uh, it was descent with modification. Everyone always ascribes the theory of evolution to Charles Darwin, but he never, ever, ever said evolution. What he said was descent with modification. 
you have an offspring, that offspring is slightly different than you. Your offspring will either now be better at reproducing or worse at reproducing. If it's better at reproducing, it will be able to pass that trait on to, other, to its offspring until it wins, until it outcompetes everything else. <laughs> this is a good question. So what eugenics is is where we're specifically picking a gene. There's no us, there's no conscious pick. It's biological. It's natural. Yeah, that's why it's called natural selection. Eugenics is what would be termed artificial selection. We do it with plants, and some people want to do it to other people. They are. They're very similar. It's actually, um, everybody knew about artificial selection. Uh, we do it with dogs. We do it with, we do it with mustard, horses. We do it with just about ev everything that we grow is artificially selected. Everything in Darwin's time was also sort of, everyone knew in order to get a bigger, riper tomato, you took two tomatoes that were big and ripe and you cross them together, you're going to get some that are terrible and some that are even bigger. You keep the seeds from the good one and you grow it again. It's heritable. It's all artificial selection. He used that concept that everyone knew this is how it worked in order to put forward this idea that if you look at selection over a long term, we know artificial selection happens. It might also happen in nature, and that's where you get the idea of natural selection. So he observed that individuals in a population vary in their traits, uh, many of which seem to be heritable. That is, you can get some traits from your parents. You are not terribly different from your parents. I know you hate me saying that. But you, you've got one head, two arms, some blood. You know, it's – you didn't come out with that. <laughs> you – um. You are very similar biologically to your parents. You may look slightly different than they do. You may act very differently than they do. But some traits are heritable. They're passed down. A population can produce far more offspring than can survive. Competition is inevitable, uh, except apparently among people. We just don't kill anyone off. But um, competition in the natural world happens all the time. And species are suited to their environments. They're adapted to their circumstances. He noticed all these things. So from that he said, individuals with inherited traits that are better suited to the local environment are more likely to survive and reproduce than less well-suited ones. That is, if you're super good at reproducing or super good at getting resources, you're going to survive. Really just makes sense, right? Um, right, you can't eat, you can't live. So the things like eat more can reproduce more. Uh, and if those, that's dependent on traits, then those traits being passed down will give them an advantage. Here we've got <laughs> the Galapagos finch. Yeah, you've seen these a thousand and one times. I'm sorry. you got different beak shapes from the very big, thick beak that's used to break open seeds to the um, very much narrower but very sharp beaks that are used to eat fruit buds um, to, let's see, what do you do? You, uh, with the number four here, I believe they eat, um, no, actually, I think they're the ones that eat from in between cacti. You know, the sp you know cactuses have spikes. You got to get between them, and it's good to have a long beak for that. This guy eats insects, and the way he eats insects, number three, is um, he typically will take a stick, tool-using bird, and that's the end of the world right there. Um, take, <laughs> like, holding it in my beak, and he sticks a stick into a hole, pulls out the grub, and then eats the grub. Each of these beaks gives them a unique advantage for their particular environment, and they're passed on to the next generation. Originally, they didn't all look like that. They all looked like the same bird. But over time, these, inher these heritable changes have accumulated. Now, when we see birds like that, we're like, they're different. We have to classify them. Humans, us, have an innate need to classify things. Hold on, uh, I need some of these names. Uh, let's see, Carlin. Hi. Okay, hypothetical situation. You get a bag of Skittles or M&Ms. What do you do with it? That's exactly what you do. Everybody does, you pick, you, you first you look at it, it's a jumble of colors, and you start sorting. We cannot stop ourselves. 
if given the opportunity, we would take a bowl of Fruit Loops and shift everything around. We just don't have the time for that in the morning. Humans need to classify things, and because of that, we impose our order on the natural world. We want to figure out, man, this dog and that dog, how are they related to each other? This flower and that flower, they all go together. So to classify them, uh, these uh, scientists called taxonomists have created a, a, a system in which domains are the top tier. We have three big domains. Everything can be divided into three groups. Eukarya, Archaea, Bacteria. Three big domains from which everything goes into. All of them are connected right here at this LUCA, last universal common ancestor. Okay, so we've got three big domains. Two of the domains, Archaea and um, bacteria are what are termed prokaryotic. Um, they, they lack compartmentalization. They lack a true nucleus. Most of, the, most of life are really, really simple organisms. Eukaryotes, on the other hand, are the super cool, interesting ones that we all want to learn about. Eukaryotes um, include anything that's got that compartmentalization, that has a nucleus. It includes you, me, sharks. That's <laughs> what do you and a shark have in common? You're both eukaryotes. Um, different protists, fungus. Most of the cool life on Earth that you want to study are eukaryotic. Multi, everything that's multicellular is eukaryotic. So we got three domains. So okay, let's play a game where I give you a domain, I give you an organism, and you tell me what domain it goes into. Check this out. Okay, fun game. Uh, let's go with a cat. Eukaryote, right. Um, a tree. Eukaryote, good, good. Uh, let's go with a thermophilic bacteria. Oh, no, no, not bacteria. Thermophilic um, prokaryote that lives in 100 degrees Celsius. <laughs> yeah, it's not arcane. It's, uh, no, I'm sorry, it's not bacteria, it's arcane, you're exactly right. So arcanes love these extreme conditions. Uh, bacteria, okay. Uh, e. coli. That's bacteria, you win! So the idea is most of the things you see around the world, most of the, everything you see is eukaryotic. It gets a little bit trickier when you get down into the two prokaryotic domains of bacteria and arcaeans. Archaeans live in extreme conditions. Hot desert. Like the, exactly, like the deep sea vents. Archaeans live there. Archaeans live um, at, the, uh, at the bottom of the ocean, piezophiles, high pressure. Pardon? At the sea vents, right. They, they live in, um, oh, there's this place in Yellowstone Park. Y right, right near the geysers. You guys know, so Yellowstone Park, geysers. This is water truth in the air, right? You good? You good, Annie? Awesome. I just remembered your name. That's why I had to go with it. Uh, and you're Katie. I'm working on it. Okay. Um, all right, so th there are these literal acid pools sitting out in the open in Yellowstone. You go for a walk, and you stay on the path. Because if you go off the path, acid pools. Um, not just acid pools. Almost boiling hot acid pools. Living in those acid pools are, um, the only thing living in them are Archaeans. They survive there just fine. Humans don't so much. A brother and sister decided to go off the track. They went off the wooden platform because what they wanted to do, not kidding, people are dumb, go down to an acid pool and stick their foot in. Now. They're not going to like dissolve right away. Well, acids will eventually too, but right, it's going to be ir what they wanted to. <laughs> you know, it's sort of like you guys know a pedicure. Okay, this is okay. We're on the same page. Uh, if you haven't had a pedicure, get one. It's worth it. Um, they're going to take a lot of. <laughs> they're like, that's a good idea. We should do that. Um, 
they're going to take like layers of skin off. Have they done that with you? That like like the peely thing. It's almost like a potato peeler, and you're like, how can all of that come off? All right. So uh, what would happen if you put your foot in that? A lot of that dead skin just get, goes away. Right. It's just not instant, but it's super fun for them. So they both they climb down there and they took off their shoes and the brother. It's not like you can just like go right to the edge and put it in. You had to climb down a little, and he climbed down. And he went to put his foot in, and he slipped. Oh. And he went face, you know, he went in. He didn't survive long, but while he was there, boiling hot water, acid. Um, it's Batman villain being waiting to be made. Um, but his sister just screamed a lot and went to go get help. Of course, by the time she got back, he was dead. Um, they couldn't do anything for him. They couldn't get him out. They couldn't get the body out. So two days later, when they finally were able to get a chopper down there in order to retrieve the body, the body was gone. Most of the – any rubber that he was wearing was also gone. All that was left was some, um, some residue of his clothes. Anyways, arcanes will mess you up. <laughs> um, <laughs> there we go. The process of science. Here we're going to talk about the scientific method, which you've been learning about since what? First, second grade, something like that? So you old hat. Now, the scientific method is what's termed a deductive process. There's two types of reasoning, inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is where you can use observed phenomena and predict future events. All right, observed phenomena, right? Did the sun come up this morning? Yes. You didn't see it, but it's, it's definitely up. Did it come up yesterday? The day before. The day before. The day before. We have, there's a pattern of sunrise. So what's going to happen tomorrow? The sun's going to rise. That's inductive reasoning. We're looking at a pattern, and then we're going to make a, uh, a general statement about it. Deductive reasoning goes in the other way. You're going to test things. You're going to come up with a proposed solution and then test it, kind of hypothesis. And then you're going to use uh, observation and then confirm your original uh, description of the world. So inductive reasoning moves from observations to seeing a pattern to forming a theory. The sun will rise because we've seen the sun come up again and again and again. Whereas deductive reasoning starts with a hypothesis this will happen, and then you test it, and then that confirms the hypothesis or refutes it. So the scientific method, what we're going to deal with is deductive. We don't use much induction in biology. You're going to use a lot of induction in um, some, sometimes in psychology, a lot in sociology. Now I do want to point out there's a difference between a scientific theory a scientific law, and the modern vernacular theory. A scientific theory is an explanation that's been of, or, uh, based upon supported hypotheses and verified many, many, many times. A theory is our absolute best understanding of how the world works right now. It's not just a random guess. Common parlance. When people are normally just talking, they're going to say things like, I have a theory about that. And when they say that, what they mean is, I have a guess. I have a, a, an educated guess, but it's just a guess. Scientists don't use theory in that way. A theory is our absolute best understanding based on lots and lots of evidence. So that's a theory. It is really, really been shown again and again. Theory of evolution. Theory of natural selection, theory of gravity, yeah, right, uh, theory of relativity, theory of, um, uh, of, 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 uh, oh shoot, do you remember those times where words just disappear? Um, theory of inheritance, chromosome theory. We have lots of theories, and they are our best explanation as to how the world works. That is not how most people use the word theory, but it's how scientists do. The other thing we'll talk about is scientific law. 
Now, a scientific law is the cornerstone of scientific discovery. A law is simple, true, and absolute. It's universal. It's everywhere. If a law did not apply, then all science based on that law would collapse. Physicists love to use laws. They always talk about laws. At least they used to. 1600s, 1700s. What are a few scientific laws you've heard of? Here, I'll say Newton's laws of gravity. OK, Newton's laws of motion. There's all sorts of laws out there. The problem is we're starting to realize that uh, humans don't know everything. Um, right, where laws need to be universal. Newton's laws of motion. What's, uh, what's in motion stays in motion until acted on by another object. Works just fine under certain circumstances. But we don't know how it works in the middle of a black hole. Right, no, there's all sorts of things we just don't know. So we're starting to understand there's a lot we don't know. So you don't get many laws nowadays. What you get now are theories. And again, scientific theory, not common parlance theory. Now, in order to discover new theories, we're going to use the scientific method. The scientific method is awesome. Let me tell you the history of the scientific method really quick. This is fun. Um, there was this guy, history. Any of you guys going into history? No. Who go into history? Um, back in the late 1500s, there was a gentleman explorer by the name of Sir Francis Bacon. Cool name. He wrote poetry. He was a fighter. He was a, uh, and he was a scientist. And he came up with this method, the idea of you make observations about the world. You come up with a question and formulate a hypothesis, your best guess as to how it works, a statement, a falsifiable statement. You develop predictions based on that statement, and then you test your predictions. And if um, your prediction is, uh, if, if the test proves that your hypothesis is correct or it, it supports your hypothesis, then you move on to develop the general theory off of that. But if it's not correct, if it shows that you're wrong, you sort of go back, you refine, you alter your hypothesis. It's a self-corrective cycle. And so he put this whole thing together. And do you know what he called it? Take a wild guess. Y you'd think scientific method, right? Sciencia, though, is not English. And he was an Englishman. He called it the Baconian method. Because scientists, if you learn nothing else, love to name things after themselves. The Baconian method. And then the people in France, the French rationalists, uh, they call uh, you guys have taken philosophy. OK, good. Well done. Keep it up. Um, the French rationalists, uh, Spinoza, Descartes, Leibniz, they turned around and said, nah, that's an English word. We're going to call it science. And the science. Sciencia, knowledge. So we're going to work on, I'm not going to go into like, you have to memorize the steps of the scientific method. You've been using the scientific method your whole life. Whether you know it or not, you have. Any, any of you guys have brothers or sisters? OK, so a bunch of you guys, do. You're, like, no siblings? You do? Brother or sister? Brother and a sister. Uh, what kind of car did your parents drive? No, no, when you were younger. Oh, wait, do you still drive in the car with them? OK, OK, and your sister? Yeah. Siblings? You're, really? Good for you. OK, your siblings in high school? OK, this is even more fun. Now, what kind of car do they have right now, then? <laughs> You're in high school and you don't know what to do. OK, how about this? Is it a little car or a big car? Little car. How many seats are there in the back? Three seats. Now, is it on a bench? Do you ever have to ride with your sibling? Sometimes? When you were younger, did you have to ride like we were all squished together? Yeah? Do you guys remember this? Yeah, you've been there. All right. What's your name again? Anna, OK, and you're Annie. Oh, sorry, <laughs> trying to work on it. Um, OK, you got your sibling. You're, were you in the middle or you were on the side? You were on the side, you were the lucky one. Um, <laughs> no, you weren't in the middle? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> if you have siblings, you know exactly, exactly what it is that sets them off. You know 
in your heart of hearts how to get them in trouble with your parents so you look good. Right? All right. Do you guys ever play the uh, when in, in the car seat? There was your section. You had the window. I assume you had the right window. Left window? <laughs> how do you not know these things? <laughs> All right. So you're in the window. Not in the window. Next to the window. You got a kid here. Now, did you let them touch you? <laughs> no. There was a buffer zone. And it was guaranteed. And what happened when they crossed that buffer zone? That's right. Something happened. Now, I guarantee you, though, you knew exactly how close you could get to your brother or sister without them swatting you. Didn't you? You could. And you, you went right to the line. And there were some times you went over the line just to see if you could. And you tested and retested and tested again. Does that make sense? You guys have done this. You know exactly what how to bother your siblings because you did it over and they were your biggest test subject. You tested them all the time. Right? You guys know what a wet willy is? <laughs> okay. Take your phone and like this and you stick it in somebody's ear. <laughs> Most people flinch, don't they? Yeah. When do they flinch? What? Once it goes in their ear. You test it again and again and again. What was your name again? Yeah. Kevin. Welcome to the front row. All right, show some. I am actually going to put my finger in your ear if you let me, by the way. I don't care. <laughs> okay, so apparently I can get what? I'm not putting my, this is the other finger, like that far. Okay, ready? Cool. Okay, still about the same. But it's cool, it's cool. <laughs> So it's the idea you can repeat these things over and over and over again. And you find out the distance. You test and you retest and you test again. You've been using science your whole life. Kids use science all the time. Put your hand on the one time, right? <laughs> but you still, it, you do it. You test and you test and you retest. So here we're going to apply the scientific method. So close. All right, so we noticed something. What do you notice? Yeah, one's missing a leg. One's got too many legs. There's something going on. You've observed this. Step one, observation. What do you do if you see a frog leaping across the road with extra limbs? What? You take a picture of it. That's right. Click. Post it all over the place. You've got your phone, you may as well take a picture. Oh, that's cool. You took a picture of it. Life's good. Probably what's going through your head, even if you stopped and you're just like, oh, picture. You're thinking to yourself, why the hell does this frog have extra legs? <laughs> there are lots of possible reasons. Give me a, uh, well, we'll get into that in a second. But the question is, how or why? Why does the frog have so many legs? What are you interested in learning? So step one, make an observation. Step two, question. Step three, do some research. Again, real life, frog, multiple legs, hopping across the road. You see it, you take the picture. What's the next thing you do? You ask a question. As you ask a question, you don't stop. <laughs> what do you do? He has enough legs to spare. No, come on, guys. What do you really do? All right. You see a frog hopping across the street. You take a picture because it's super cool. We can do that. You ask yourself, why does this frog have so many legs? Then what do you do? Do you go on with your life? Do you look it up? Where do you look it up? That's right. You have your phone out. You just took a picture. So now you Google it. You go to the John Tyler website. Find something from the library. Look it up. That's the right answer. <laughs> Not what I would have done. I would have absolutely gone to Google. You find out a possible explanation. You come up with a hypothesis. That's the answer right there? All right. With your hypothesis, what is a possible explanation for this? Mutation. mutation sure, why not? Genetic mutation. Oh, was this the one that didn't work? Yeah. Genetic mutation. Give me one more hypothesis. That's it. Everyone's like, that's all it could be. Mutation. It's a weird freak frog. 
Evolution. That's genetic mutation still. Mutation. <laughs> Anything that's not a mutation. Ooh, conjoined frog twin. That's not really a mutation, so that's not heritable. Conjoined frog twin. I like that one. Anything else? Science project gone bad. Evil science. Somebody stapled a le another leg on. Yeah. So we can look through these, and we can start trying to figure out what's the problem. What could have caused this? We need to create a falsifiable hypothesis. All right, falsifiable means it can be shown to be wrong. Um, it has the potential to be disproven. You can never, ever prove a hypothesis. You can only support it. So here's the deal. Um, by, uh, in ca okay. My academic history, by the way, I was never really meant to be a biologist. I always loved science. But uh, my undergraduate degree is in philosophy um, with uh, religion. And I got biology, you know, because I happened to take a bunch of classes in biology because I thought it was fun. And then I realized I couldn't get a job in any of those other fields. <laughs> so, biologist. But a common philosophical syllogism, um, a statement that proves itself. One, swan, all swans are white. Two, that is a swan. Therefore, the swan is white. But then they found Australia. And Australia messes everything up all the time. Uh, in case you didn't know, Australia will kill you if you go there. Australia is uh, pretty much the deadliest place on Earth. There is a box jelly the size of your thumbnail that will kill you before you realize you've been stung. Um, anyways, super fun thoughts. Scorpions, spiders, uh, dangerous, dangerous snakes, anything. Yeah, if it's evil. Is, oh, koalas with um, syphilis. There we go. Um, and black swans. Not nearly as scary now. <laughs> and black swans! Um, it, it disproves that whole syllogism. It's no longer all swans are white. So we have to create a hypothesis. And a hypothesis is a statement about how the world works. I want to be very, very clear on this. If-then statements are not hypotheses. If-then statements are predictions that you create from a hypothesis. It's one of my pet peeves, sorry. Um, you're going to create a falsifiable statement. So the genetic mutation, I'm sorry, genetic mutations cause frogs to have multiple limbs is a hypothesis. The prediction, if frogs have genetic mutations, then they will have um, multiple limbs, is the prediction that you will test from that hypothesis. Do you see the difference? There is a difference. So when you're writing hypotheses, do not write if-then statements. I know you were originally taught to do that, and they taught you wrong, and I'm sorry. Welcome to real science. You're going to test those predictions using a controlled experiment. An experiment or test will be conducted to gather all this stuff. So how are we going to test this genetic mutation? If, if uh, how are we going to test our hypothesis, genetic mutations, cause frogs to have multiple limbs. All right, so we're going to do frog breeding. No, we could totally do that. No, I'm, I'm, I'm down with that. We could, do, we could do some frog breeding. Um, the trick we're going to need to deal with with the controlled experiment is we need to really look at our variables. Variables are any part of the experiment that might change during, uh, or any part that might change during the experiment. Um, you want to keep as many variables as you can consistent so that the only variable that you're looking at, the only variable that might change, is the one that you're interested in. That's called the independent variable. The independent variable is the variable that you as the scientist caused to change the thing that you are interested in. So that's the independent variable. It is independent. It is the one you manipulate, the one that you change. 
the independent variable is going to have an effect on the dependent variable. This is a factor in the experiment you're interested in measuring. So for us, our independent variable, in this case, we've got genetic mutation, frog breeding. How could we, let's see, how can I put this? Nobody's ever come up with genetic mutation as a hypothesis before for this particular exercise. How would you test that? <laughs> Hold on, let me go to the next slide. <laughs> controlled groups and controlled variables. Some variables, anything that you keep the same is a controlled variable. Um, if we look at these glasses, what is the same between these two glasses? The amount of water. What else? The size. The shape of the glass. Probably the temperature. There's all sorts of things that are kept the same. What's different? Yeah, there's the gunk, the dirt, whatever it is, the substance inside. So you have the controlled variables are everything except for that one thing that you have changed. Whatever's in there. The pollution, we'll call it that, sure. Um, so then that pollution is the independent variable. It's the only thing that's different. The dependent variable is going to be the results of what happens with that gunk. And you can create a controlled experiment uh, by incorporating a control group, a group that is, for lack of a better word, totally normal, real life, and a group that's experimental, the one that you have manipulated, the one that you have changed the independent variable on. So we're going to be doing a lot of controlled experiments in this course. So now that we've all got that same vocabulary, we have a control group and we need an experimental group. Do you guys, are you all good on with this frog breeding thing? All right, so we can breed some frogs. We take a frog. Here we got our weird three-legged, you know, multi-legged frog. What do we do with it? Well, we captured it, so we're holding it. You breed it with what? With what? A control frog, so like a normal looking frog. Uh, let's go over here, we'll pick up a normal frog. So over here, we got a pond full of normal frogs. Hey look, there's a normal frog, yay! Hey, check it out, every frog in this pond has a ton of legs. For those of you going into business, you're thinking, and now we've got the new product. <laughs> so what do we do? We've got a bunch of frogs in this pond over here that have lots of, lots and lots of extra limbs and none over there. Well, they've, they've got limbs. I mean, don't get me wrong. They've got normal limbs, normal limbs. <laughs> well, it's kind of fun frog time. All right, so we got two abnormal frogs. Do we put them at like, do, do we do it all in the same tank? Okay, that, that'll cook a frog. All right, so we got, um, <laughs> well, we're talking Fahrenheit, not Celsius. Sorry. Um, <laughs> all right, so we got, we got a big aquarium here, two abnormal looking frogs. We put them together, we start, that, that's frogs mating apparently. <laughs> um, they're dropping down a bunch of eggs, life's good. The eggs start growing in this tank. What's in this? What's uh, in here? Okay, but what I'm well, okay, but what I'm saying is, what or did we just drop them into? I mean, it's a tank, but what's in this tank? What kind? Fresh water, pond water. So just like, swish. Okay, put them in there. What? We we did. Eggs. They grow up. They're all multi-legged. All right. Now what do we do? Okay. Hmm. We have a much smaller container. <laughs> all right. So uh, the water from there. Two normal frogs. Put them in, and they're all normal. Yep. Totally normal. Oh wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry. Did you tell me to breed one of those frogs over here? Two normal frogs into the water from that pond, they're all normal. Okay. Yep. Okay, uh, I need another tank, don't I? <laughs> I have to put them both in the sand. 
Another tank. Where's this water? Yeah. Where'd it come from? <laughs> we just, yeah, we totally screwed that up. But we put them in! <laughs> and they're all weird. All of them are abnormal. Okay, let's uh, chill there. <laughs> yes. Wait, and when you have a comment, just start yelling. Otherwise, I'm going to totally miss you. Okay, environmental factor. Okay. Ooh, something in the water. How would we test that? So we took our old hypothesis, and we've started something new. And that's the way science works. I'm running out of time. I didn't expect that to happen in a three-hour lecture. <laughs> okay, what now? What do we do? What do we do? I got to figure out this frog thing before we go. I only got one. <laughs> all right. That's right. They're all weird. Oh, you can't safely assume that yet. What's the last thing you have to do? We've checked in this one with the normal frogs, and we get all weird. And they're all normal. That's the way it works, right? <laughs> Real life experiment, by the way. I'm not making this stuff up. Well, I'm making this part up, but I'm not like, like this actually happens, yeah. OK, so uh, now what? You said environmental effects. So how well can we test? Yeah, you figure out the water quality. All right, I'm going to stop us there for about three minutes. You've been working on this. So you guys, I need you to use the scientific method. Figure out the answer, OK? I'm going to give you until 12.08 to figure out the answer of why these things have multiple limbs. So a minute and a half. All right, so give me what ideas you just came up with. Anything? There's something in the water, but we don't know what. What's in the water? We figured out it's probably the water. You got the environmental effects. Something's in the water. What is it? It's not. But thanks for trying. Not radiation either. Not an enzyme that's messing with their breeding. Come on, guys. Give you another minute. All right, so you've had a lot of fun ideas, and they would take a lot of time to test. Going through the scientific method, what's the first step? Right, and you got that, right? Many limbs. Second step. Question. Question is, why do they have all these things? Third step. No. Research. And what did none of you do? Research. All of you have phones sitting right in front of you that you were just checking. Why didn't you use them? Yeah, but then I said, ignore that. <laughs> Listen to what I say. This is what I say. So the idea is you could find out the answers. It's going to save you as a scientist so much time. It, people have done research on things all the time. Um, so this is about control groups. Still. Sorry, I missed this slide. Uh, you got positive groups and neg uh, positive control groups and negative control groups. The positive control group is the one you know will definitely work. The negative control group is the one you know will definitely not work. For our frogs, which one would definitely not produce frogs with multiple limbs? The clean water. That's the, po the negative control. And we figured out one that definitely does work. That would be the positive control. Does that make sense? You, the, the trick is you need to deter you need to do some research first. Exactly. You would have to do research into that. That's exactly it. The research will tell you your positive and negative controls. Gather your data. We got two kinds of data: quantitative data and qualitative data. Quantity, 
numbers. We biologists love numbers. Qualitative data, touchy-feely descriptions. I hate those. Quantitative measurements are what we want. Qualitative works to support quantitative. But in the end, as far as uh, hard science is concerned, we want numbers. We analyze the data, we put it together into a graph or something that we can measure, and we draw our conclusions. We accept or we reject our hypothesis. Now for us, we rejected several of our hypotheses. We finally did some research and we figured out the, pro the answer. Did anybody figure out the answer? No, of course not. It was caused by a protist. You guys know the frog life cycle? Frogs go from egg to tadpole, tadpole to froglet, froglet to um, frog. So as a tadpole, they end up getting this protist right about where their hips are forming. And that protist does spins. And when it spins around, it ends up disrupting the cells that are going to become the legs, which leads to an abnormal number of legs. The more you know. So we've applied the scientific method. We determine whatever limitations we have. We report. We publish. Uh, we get it out to people. And we let everyone else know what's going on. Otherwise, if we didn't let people know what's going on, they'd be sitting in a class trying to figure out why do frogs have so many limbs. <laughs> Here's a historical example of the scientific method. I know I'm going to go right up till the end. Sorry. I'm hungry, too. Um, this guy's name is Francesco Reddy. Francesco Reddy is a horse-faced gentleman who um, did some research into the spontaneous generation of life. You see, for the longest time, people thought that living matter came from non-living matter. That is, a leaf landing on water would become fish. That's how we got fish. And they thought this because if, you, if a leaf lands on water, you see baby fish darting out from underneath it. Yeah. So, and then and they thought, hey turns into mice. Because if you go into the barn and you pick up a bale of hay, mice come out of it. Thus, the hay is turning into mice. Um, frogs uh, are born from mud. Because if you look at uh, the river banks right in the first spring rain, the mud starts to boil. And uh, these muddy frogs pop out of it. Because you know mud turns into frogs. Yeah, he was a long time ago. That, you, you couldn't tell from the picture? Um, you've got um, flies are born from rotting meat. When you have meat hanging out, flies uh, are created from it. Oh, and my other favorite is um, bees come from flowers. Because in the morning you go outside and you see flower bees just flying out of flowers. So the problem is, how do new living beings come into existence? And he really focused on flies here, and he said, well... Maggots appeared on meat after a few days. Uh, there was no microscope at the time. They weren't really around, so there's no way to see that there were eggs. But he thought that the maggots came from eggs that were laid by flies. So his hypothesis, flies produce maggots, just that easy. And he looked at, um, he, he set up a, an experiment in which you had several different containers. Some containers were sealed, others were open. And there was meat in the bottom of each container. He created a control group and an experimental group. Now, here we have two groups, C uncovered and covered. Which is more like real life? W uncovered, that's the control group. What happens in the control group after a few days, do you think? Lots of flies. In the experimental group, the one that he changed, um, not so many So we have the control group, the experimental group. We have several variables that are the same. What are the same? What are the controlled with an ED variables? What are the things that are the same between each? Meat, temperature, exposure to air, size of the container, type, yeah, um, location, all these things. They are all kept consistent. The only difference between them is the independent variable which is the covering. He collected data. This is really just an example of a lecture to show you a bunch of maggots, I guess. 
He created data, uh, charts and tables. He looked at them, and he drew conclusions. Wow, that's small. Sorry about that. He restated his hypothesis. Flies produce maggots. He accepted it. His conclusions were that flies lay eggs too small to be seen, maggots found on rotting meat are produced from the eggs laid by flies, and maggots are not appearing due to spontaneous generation. That's what he came up with. Yeah, that's good, right? And uh, he didn't see many limitations, so he went ahead and published the study. Um, and that was the end of spontaneous generation. Everyone said, okay, well, obviously, now that he's shown that flies come from um, meat or don't come from meat, that's the end of that. Except it wasn't. Turns out, a guy named John Needham said, no, I think you're wrong. Because when I leave a thing of chicken noodle soup out overnight, it grows stuff in it. You guys have left chicken noodle soup overnight, haven't you? Yeah. Don't eat it the next morning. It's disgusting. So he boiled it. He boiled this chicken broth, effectively. Nothing was in it. A day later, it was filled with stuff. Spontaneous generation. So what did Reddy say to him? He said, did you cover it? And he said, no. So then this guy comes along, Lazaro Spallanzini, who was Reddy's nemesis, and said, yeah, well, I will. So he put a cork, he boiled it and had a cork in it. The next day, it was totally um, clear. A few days later, stuff was growing. So he said, therefore, spontaneous generation happens. This went back and forth for like 50 years. Anyway, do you guys know why this happened? You guys have ever seen, uh, you're a little young, I know. Have you seen corks before? Corks. What's in a cork? Holes, right. <laughs> Bacteria. <laughs> the nail in the coffin came about 30 or 40 years later by a guy named Louis Pasteur. You probably heard of him, pasteurization. What? Uh, no, he didn't make antibiotics. He um, killed bacteria. He created the swan neck. So what would happen is you boil the stuff with um, uh, uh, bacteria in it. It kills all the bacteria off. Um, and then the steam goes out through the vent, but the bacteria get trapped in that little neck. So thank you. So then over time, I'm trying, I'm trying, two minutes. Um, he let it sit for a day, a week, two weeks, a month. Uh, six months, and nothing grew until he broke off the top. And the day after he broke off the top, it was filled with stuff. This is what put the nail in the casket, and he's the one who's credited with uh, really killing the idea of uh, spontaneous generation. So there we go. Now, I talk fast. I know I talk fast. And I also know that probably in about 10 to 15 minutes ago, half you stopped taking notes. Uh, because it's the end of class. I get it. Here's the deal. I will probably usually go up pretty close to the end of class. I'm sorry. I have a lot to say. I will do my best to post this online as fast as I can. You have access to the PowerPoints. Don't forget them. Um, before you go, uh, I will always have these content review questions. There's also review questions. All the, ev all, a lot of resources for you on the website. Please check it out. There's more. 